Thank you, Emily. All right, that's awesome. I don't have to say the meeting's yeah. being recorded, so. <laughs> New, <figure. laughs> New technology. I don't want to be well, surprised, I guess. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I think we should uh, call the board to order. Um, I will uh, start with uh, uh, Kenzie. Kenzie Berry is present. Nikki. She's present. Let's see. Nancy. Nancy Hendrickson present. Corky. Corky's present. Ken Anderton's present. Looks like we have everyone. All right. Is there any uh, public testimony? I think was what's next on the agenda. There is none that I'm aware of. All righty. With that, let's just roll into uh, Kelly's uh, contract of. Um, good morning. Um, this is going to be a new um, standing agenda item for all the boards. True. We just want to um, make sure that we make time to do these contract approvals um, when they are necessary. So generally that's going to be over $50,000 for single district contracts. And that's going to be both contracts and task orders that are issued under existing price agreements. Um, and then $100,000 for multi-district contracts. Um, and so this is just kind of to get everybody um, used to having this as an agenda item and to remind us to make sure that we put those on your agenda for you. Um, this week, I don't know that we have any, but generally um, Nick is going to be presenting those when um, we need to have you um, approve them. So are there any questions on that? Um, this, this stems back to the local contract review board rules that um, you all passed back in 2015. We're currently working on um, some revised signing authorities and LCRB rules that we'll be bringing to you um, around the end of June-ish. Um, but this is what we have currently. And so that's what we're using to um, decide when to bring these um, contract approvals to the board. We appreciate the transparency and bringing these up to the board. And for the new board member, I'm thinking, Kenzie, you know, perhaps we can get a copy of that board resolution of, from 2015. To that would be great. Yeah, sure. would love to have some background on like the internal governance that would precede it um, coming to the board. So thank you. Yeah, we can definitely send that to you. Thanks. All right, any other questions? With that, uh, Kelly, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to the the main the main course here, which is uh, budget discussion. Peggy, you want to do an intro, as is your wont? But you're muted now. You can't do it that way. You're still muted. That can be there. You are. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm getting the feeling people will want me muted, but you know, you're stuck with me for two more days. So um, first of all, I just want to share with everyone, I want to thank Casey and staff for, for, for proposing and developing an economically viable budget this year. Um, it made it a little easier um, my second go round to, to do that, but staff, um, we... Our strategy, one of the things that we made clear was to, our goal was to present a budget that reflects the critical priorities that staff can, re, can realistically execute. Um, considering, you know, available resources during COVID and the increasing amount of ta staff time for the urban flood safety water quality district. And the other thing that I really requested is for, in, for um, projects that were coming forward to really evaluate what could be done in one year if we should be, if there are projects that really um, made sense that it took more than a year, like P the Portland Metro Levy system, um, 
then let's look at how it can be done in steps and build upon it. And staff really took that to heart. This is very similar to some of the work we've done on document management, easements, et cetera. Um, and a recognition that we recognize the budget requests our commitment to the board and the landowners of what is needed and can be executed reliably within a year. Um, just as an order of priority, priority of course is our first and foremost, the critical flood safety and system and the integrity of that system. Then another is preparing for the um, pre-construction engineering design process, which we, um, will be coming into view for work over the next few years. Um, also making sure that we have our easements in order to not only support PED, but also for us to have a good understanding of what we have and don't have and what we need to continue to do our work. Um, the multi-district projects, we're focused more on moving forward and preparing for consolidation, not you know just a, a, a number of other things. That was really the focus. So um, on that note, I want to again thank Casey for all of his patience, due diligence and hard work. Um, and so I will now turn it over to Casey. Oh, thank you. Oh boy, here we are. Um, I am going to uh, basically walk through the summary, the Word document summary that went out with your packet, um, hitting the highlights, trying to avoid going through every little item. Um, and I'm gonna be looking at my other screen, so I'm gonna be looking over here. And uh, then open it up for questions. You can interrupt me if there's something that you wanna ask about while I'm in the middle of something, of course, and then we'll talk about a little bit about the bigger picture and a little bit about uh, where we go from here on the budget process. So with that, we'll dive in at the top. Um, total resources and requirements, total amount of the budget is $15.6 million with 8.6 of revenue and 10 million um, in expenditures. That's a deficit of 1.6 million, virtually all of which um, is attributable to capital projects that are paid for by the capital loan money that we have in hand. So operating costs are pretty much uh, a wash this year between expenditures and revenue. Starting the year with a beginning balance of $7 million, that's three and a half million less than you started um, this current year. And that is attributable again to capital. We bought those three wonderful shiny new energy efficient pumps and put them in uh, at pump station one and that ate up a whole lot of money. Revenue 8.6 million. We are looking at a nine and a half percent assessment increase next year. We work really hard to keep it under 10. Um, revenue of 8.6, 5.3 million in assessments. The major big um, change is that increase in assessment revenue of $460,000 and contract revenue is up $400,000 because of uh, higher expectation of how much time the staff is going to be taking working for the UFSWQD, which will pay um, those staff costs as depending on how much time people spend. Um, other revenue, small amount, $110,000. Expenditures, uh, 10,160,000, that's down almost 2 million from last time, which is pretty much all attributable to capital again. Personal services is up to $6 million, that's 8.5%. We're looking at adding five new FTE um, listed in the sheet here, a project manager for the urban district, which will be paid for by the urban district a grant manager, a record specialist to help us with our large backlog of easement and document management work, a finance specialist to address staffing need in accounting, and uh, an additional 
um, tech O and M technician for the ops crew. Salaries and wages are up seven and a half percent. We assume increases for a combination of COLA and merit to be at four percent. Payroll taxes are up mirroring the salary increases because they're just percentages of salary. PERS and health insurance are up with the addition of new staff and with rate increases in both of them. Um, employee support is down a bit. Materials and services, yes? Casey, yeah, Nancy. I had one question. I think I know the answer, but I just want to hear you okay. <laughs> So we, uh, Karen Carrijo left us and she, I forget what her, position name was, but um, I didn't see that in this, in these new, these five new FTEs. And is that because we're still hiring for it, but it's not a new FTE, yeah. it's an existing FTE. Yeah, we will, okay. we will we'll keep the position and find somebody to fill it, we hope, um, approaching as well as Karen, it's caught in did. But right. yeah, the Thank position you. is there. Thanks. There's also a position that's in the budget this year, but didn't get filled to replace my position, which is um, which will be a, a regular employee as opposed to um, a seasonal temp, which is what I am. Um, okay, any other questions up to now? Thank you. And you'll probably have to jump in because I'm not looking at my screen. So I, I will just make one little comment on what you just said, Casey. Yeah is you're invaluable and it will be very hard to replace you Thanks. at any price. <laughs> I'm still not coming back. <laughs> We're hoping. We're still hoping. <laughs> All right. Uh, materials and services budget is flat next year. Operations is up some. You know, you do some projects some year, other projects up and down, but it's it's uh, up a little bit, two and a half percent. Projects and planning is down. There are 18 projects, 18 line items in the budget. Half of those are multi-district projects. I'm not going to go into leasing and reading through what they all are. I figure you've read these, and if you have any questions, you'll ask. I do want to call out uh, two new projects for PMLS that is hitting all the districts next year, uh, one for project support and one for easement gap analysis, which um, is a total of $35,000 next year for those. And there are three projects paid from grants and six that are ongoing stuff that we do all the time, or in the case of tow drain analysis, we do it periodically. Professional services is up 38% to $464,000. The biggest change there is a request for $75,000 in engineering for consulting for development of a construction management plan. Um, if you have questions about that, I will um, deflect them over to Bill. Um, legal is down, HR and organizational development are up some. There is also uh, an increase in strategic asset management for a $35,000 request for a consultant to guide us through the process of selecting a computerized maintenance management system, which I will also let Bill answer if anybody asks any questions. Contracts and agreements, uh, the usual suspects there, the payment to the JCA is our share of the partnership. Um, and $1,000 for operating costs at the Vanport pump station, which is in pen one, but for some reason, MCDD pays for it. Uh, and the port pays for that, port reimburses us, reimburses us for those costs, that was hard to say. Um, this category is down this year because there is uh, no out-of-pocket expense to MCDD for helping shore up the, uh, the urban district. Where there was $32,000 in the current year budget. Administrative expenses are also pretty flat. They're up a 10th of a percent. Um, the noteworthy thing here is an increase of $15,000 for security patrols following break-ins to the MCDD campus in the current year. Oh, then we get to capital, million five six oh, seven. I'm, yes. I'm gonna jump in again, just yeah. that I'm noticing Noticing one of those, you know, silver linings of this emergency are that 
we're able to get rid of the modular building because we're mm -hmm. able to um, staff want flexibility to work from home. That means we don't need as many desks in the office. And I yeah. just want to point that out. I think that's an interesting. We're, we are assuming that we're going to keep the two modules we have, modulars that we have, but not add a third, which had been in the works. Oh, I see. Great. So, I still think it's know, cool. Maybe it'll work out that we won't need it, but um, I've got to work all that out and see. Can I, can I add just work. one clarification there? Um, yes. You're right. We have two modular buildings for staff. Technically, we do have a third for storage purposes um, uh, right next to one of our pole barns. So we, we do have three, oh. pieces, uh, but only two of those are staff related. Okay, sorry, didn't know that. I haven't been on campus in a long time. <laughs> Don't even hardly remember what it looks like. Um, okay, on to capital. Capital is down, as I mentioned before. Um, we're doing a number of things. We hope finally to complete the water line extension that has been around as an item since I've been here um, in various phases of life. Gravity flow station, the schedule has changed for that. The construction of that is going to be done <clears throat> after consolidation, be funded by the urban district, but there is work to do for pre-design inspection and permitting ahead of time. So that's the $185,000. OSHA fall protection is largely taking the year off in MCDD, focusing on other districts. Uh, access ports at pump station one and four will be completed next year. We're moving on to the next phase of the trash rake replacement at uh, pump station one, which will continue into next, into two more years after next year. Um, installing a new trash rake at the Broadmoor pump station, which will be a two-year project and be more expensive next year. And a pen pump station four trash rake. So we're using, I think it seems that we're using um, a lot of the capital loan dollars for upgrades, improvements, modernization, you name it, for the pump stations. And then a little bit of work on McBride Slough, but more of the meat of that work is going to come later. Equipment replacement, $726,000, largely larger than we had expected because of some vehicles and equipment that were budgeted for this year, but we weren't able to complete. Biggest thing is an equipment barge, and then we got a dump truck and backhoe and fun stuff like that. Debt service, just shy of $700,000, primarily for the capital loan, which is $661,000. There's another 36 for a flex lease, and this will be the last year of that. So where does that leave us at the end of the year? It leaves us with an ending balance of $5.4 million, almost all of which is um, available for spending. There's 191,000 in the undesignated reserve. Um, I've got 3.75 million in the capital reserve, which is the what's left of the capital loan, which is around $2 million. So we expect to have at the end of this year left of that. And we should hit our target of spending at least 85% of it in the first three years. Um, but there's other money in there to continue covering capital needs through consolidation with general um, revenues. The operating reserve is targeted at being one sixth of operating costs, non-capital costs um, in the coming year. And, and then um, we used to be an equipment replacement reserve that's just getting folded into the operating reserve. It was an old thing, we don't need it anymore. And a little bit of money and restricted for money that we got that's for stipulated projects. So $1.6 million deficit, pretty much all of which is capital. And what does this all mean? Um, MCDD could cover its cost next year with, and through the next three or four years with, um, what did I say? Eight and 7% assessment increases. But the uh, addition of PED, pre-construction, 
pre-construction engineering and design costs for PMLS kind of leaves us in a place of not being completely sure of where we're headed financially in the next few years, because we, we're not sure what the total numbers are going to be. And we're not sure how they're going to be apportioned among the districts. And we're not sure whether we're going to be, whether the districts will be able to get any outside funding help to help defray those $5.6 million of estimated costs. Without that, as I said, you could get by with seven and eight percent increases. It looks like with the numbers that I've run out that if MCDD has its um, $1.8 million share, which is a number, it's the latest number we've got, but we don't know how good it is. Um, you could get by with continued nine and a half percent increases and do everything you plan to do and do the PMLS PED work, nine and a half percent increases until consolidation. You won't need that necessarily in 21-22, except that if those costs come in at or near what we expect them to come in, then you probably have to have increases breaking the 10% threshold in one or more of the following years. So the nine and a half percent this year that we're recommending that, and that's in the proposed budget is um, conservative, hoping we're not going to need as much in the following years as we might, but um, planning for that in case it's necessary. If the costs go down, you can have less in the way of assessment increases in the out years. That's my pitch. Um, I'm open to questions and discussion and all that. That was a showstopper, wasn't it? <laughs> you did such a good job, you left us speechless, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> One, one thing I just wanted to point out is on the ties back to what Nancy had, the question Nancy had asked about the diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, one thing I also wanted to be broken out was the, the social justice um, aspects. And so we, we don't have a specific line item, but it's included in that 41, I think it's 41,000 on the line item. <laughs> Uh, because I want us to get in the habit of budgeting similar to what the new F squad budget would be because of the new mission. So starting to, to reflect the new mission as we start to move forward budgeting into the until we get to the new the new district uh, standing up the new district. Any additional questions on the budget. So I'd say I appreciate that I appreciate that Ken and you are our budget liaison this year weren't you. Yes, he was, and we met I am. a week or two ago. Thank you, Thank you <laughs> for doing that. <laughs> yes, uh, Casey and I have been quite buddies and peggity. So. <laughs> I have a quick question. It doesn't get to the meat of the um, discussion, I think, that Casey just teed up for us, but following up on Nancy's question or comment on the modular, uh, building savings. I was curious about increased expense at supporting employees transitioning to work from home. Uh, is that something that just kind of netted out in, in this year's budget or should we expect like a, a one-time expense for that? Or did we see a one-time expense for that? I'll let that's, a, that's a very good question. And um, we are in the process of trying to look. We had money this year, this last year, to help provide some support for staff at home. We are now initiating, and I would give Emily credit for this, of beginning a survey of kind of how we are going to, what it looks like to work in the future. And, um, and what that means, and I think that you know, my, my initial comment is number one, we aren't gonna provide every employee two places to work. That is not the responsibility to our landowners to, you know, to work from home or work from the office. We're not gonna give you two computers. We're not gonna give you two desks, et cetera. But 
working through that process of what is the best way, depending on the work that they do. I anticipate that there'll be a clear understanding when Jim comes on and there's a, a broader discussion. It takes a broader discussion. There's some individuals within the organization that can't work from home. Um, finance has been one that there's always been someone in the office. Obviously our operations staff is there <laughs> all the time. Um, and people have been coming and going. So it's it's a matter of of reassessing how we work before we kind of make final decisions of how that's funded. Yeah, I would add, um, as far as this year, really the biggest costs um, for the admin budget for that transition was um, our computers. Just uh, most of the laptops we have, I don't think we're meant for like eight or 10 hours straight. And so we had a much big, like faster turnover on our like computer replacement than we usually do. But because we, it did net out just with the no staff travel reimbursements, no, um, a lot of those other uh, expenses that we had as far as, especially like our meetings on site um, that we were able to just kind of move that money around and it did net out. And a little electricity, a little less. I mean, they're just little mm -hmm. pieces here and there. Well, I think Kenzie's going to help you with electricity. Oh. Yes, Kenzie. <laughs> yeah, well, not, at, not at the office building. That's PP&L country. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I thought, I thought we had a, a route there for reduced. <laughs> yeah, but the pumps, the pumps consume a lot more electricity <laughs> throughout the system. Yeah, I, I, I would caution looking at the work from home scenario as a money saver. Um, it might turn out that way, you know, and that's great. But uh, like you said, you've you got to upgrade computers now. And what about their electricity that they're using at home? A, a, a proper desk, you, you know, you know it, it, it could work out well, but you know, I don't think that goes into the budget. So, Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that. I just noticed that, oh, we don't need another module. Yeah. But it's, and I appreciate what you're talking about, Peggy, um, with the survey and, and working with staff because we're doing the same thing at the city, probably the, all the, lots of businesses and companies and governments are doing the same thing. It's like, oh, well, we were forced into this new normal. What does it look like afterwards? What's the best mix in terms of flexibility, productivity, business needs, all that kind of stuff, but it can affect your real estate, right? Like. Absolutely, it, it, it certainly affects your footprint. So, um, and I think one of the questions you, the boards are gonna be faced with in the coming months is do you continue to do board meetings this way? Or do you come into a, the office? Those things make a difference as well. Those are all the little things that have to be put together to, to determine the entire new normal. Yeah, because a board, an all online board meeting like this is very different than a mix of in-person and online. I don't know how we, I've seen some equipment for that that's kind of expensive, but I don't know how we quite pull that off. Yeah. When we do have that system at our office, you'll recall that we can do yeah. in-person. We have the setup for that. Somehow we were way ahead of the curve on that. <laughs> Uh, I've got a separate question on reserves, if that's okay. Um, so we've, we've been chopping this, our reserves down for a few years here, um, and it makes me nervous. Uh, uh, can you comfort me on the plan for a $2 million reserve? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I've run out projections for five years of anticipated revenues with whatever the assumed assessment increase rate is going to be um, and assumed expenditures. We have a capital plan. We have a pretty good idea what those costs are going to be. We know how much of that is going to be is going to be and has been paid by the loan. We know what we're going to have to pay in debt service. I assume a 2% increase annually for materials and services costs and a 4% increase for personnel over the term. Um, and with the increase, 
we end each year except one with at least $2 million. And in that year, it's just slightly under $2 million. Two million is the number that Janet told me we need to get through um, until November when assessments start to come in, the big slug of revenue that gets us through the rest of the year. But we have some other revenues that do come in earlier. For example, a quarter and maybe even a half of the BES revenue that's upwards of $600,000 a year comes in in the first few months. So the, you don't necessarily need to have $2 million in the bank at all times in, on the 1st of July, because we do get some more of that revenue. Um, I'm comfortable with the numbers that, that I've looked at and poured over for a long time, um, that we will be, that MCDD will be able to stay in a place where you can meet your cash flow needs throughout this four or five years of transition. Even you have been running through your reserves, but remember a lot of the reserves that you've run through in the last three years have been spending the loan money. And I'd be happy to take a look at what, how the reserves have gone step net of the loan money and net of the capital that's being paid by the loan. That, that'd be a good exercise. I'll put that together between now and the next meeting. Thanks. Uh the other question I've got, and this may not be the right place for it, so Peggy or or Ken, you know, shuffle me in, in another direction if you want. But um, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I'm, I'm not real familiar with the 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 how Nick's you know, new position intersects with the loss of K, Casey's position, and uh, so I, I believe we're replacing Casey. The idea is replace Casey. So, uh, how is that all working together? We have a new employee with Nick. Casey thinks he's leaving. He doesn't know that we're reverse engineering the loss in the building right now. Um, we have an ankle bracelet on him. Yes. <laughs> it's on order, Amazon. Um, let, me an let me answer uh, on, on the broader scale. Nick came in as CFO and Deputy Director of Administration. He's overseeing the finance group, the administrative group, HR, records management, and budget. We have always, and that was a replacement of Sunny. So we switched that position so that there was, um, especially with the value of, of what um, Nick brings from his public budget experience, public budget law, and his experience with school systems. We still need to replace Casey as a Casey for a budget position. That position reports to Nick. I had forgotten Sonny was the missing element there, and I can't believe I forgot that. So thank you. You're welcome. I would add a detail I won't tell her. To, if it's okay with you, boss. The current plan, it's under transition right now, Corky, we're still working it through, but the latest plan is I've been talking quite a bit with uh, Janet Olson, our finance manager, and Casey worked about half time the last several years in the budget, um, because as you know, so my current plan is, and it's still evolving, is probably going to post a combined half-time budget analyst, half-time finance specialist. So the other half of the year, this new person would work with, with Janet in the finance office. In my mind, the two go fairly well together. Casey's an awesome budget person. Most budget people also are experienced in finance. So we're hoping to find that basically to kill two birds with one stone there and double duty on this person. And we will evolve it as we go. Well, just replacing Casey's double duty right there. So <laughs> that is that is true. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, any, any other questions? Um, great discussion, Hong. Yeah, I just have a, a comment um, as I was just listening to the budget discussion in reference to the loan. Um, and I don't mean to burst Bill's bubbles, but um, one of the issues that he's going to touch on in the assets and liability draft report is, is um, a delineation of all of the debts that the dis various districts owe. Um, Nothing to 
to, to decide on, but I want to just uh, tee it up for this particular group just because the MCDD debt is the most, the most significant in, in terms of the amount. Um, as we transition and consolidate into the urban district, there will need to be a negotiation of the debt distribution plan. And, and it could be at this point, and, and um, it hasn't been decided or even discussed how the district's debts are, are going to be addressed, whether the districts are going to be expected um, to pay it off entirely before it occurs, or that some portion of it is going to be absorbed in, by the urban district um, through its future rates and, and general uh, obligation bond. And the, the reason why I just raise it with this particular board is because you do have the most significant amount of debt owing as you progress um, to into the next few years. Um, so that's just something to, to think about in the, in the back of the mind. Thanks, Hong. Um, and that brings up one other question I have on the, the budget is, do we have an adequate legal budget for all the things that we need to get done between us and the the new district. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm trying to cover you, Hong. <laughs> <laughs> I would add that's one of the shortest answers Hong has ever given on a legal I, question. <laughs> I know. I was expecting a much more in depth <laughs> question there or uh, answer there. So, um, any other questions uh, regarding the budget? And remind me, Emily, what the process is on the budget. Uh, this is discussion during this session and then there's adoption. So typically this meeting, if you have any feedback, um, then Casey will take it back and workshop that. And then also um, you have, an, so you have another meeting scheduled before adoption. And usually we also have a better idea of your imbalance by then. So. Um, uh, or like projections. And so it comes to you pretty much final in your next budget meeting. And then uh, for the adoption, which will be at the format at the last in the, the very end of the month in June, um, at that point, it's usually coming to you as you are expecting it just for approval without a lot of discussion. So if you have feedback, it usually comes now. Next meeting, you can workshop it a bit more and then um, adoption. So you'll see it two more times. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, any additional comments or any, any scenarios that we can ask to be run that you would like to see? I, I know there's a couple things we've asked for. Anything else? I will take that as no. Uh, <laughs> but there is time, I believe, if you do think of something to send Emily a note say, saying uh, you would like it like clarification on um, and that can be discussed in the next meeting, I assume. All right, I guess we're done with the budget topic. Um, we were gonna switch around the agenda bec because uh, Emily, Emily and I thought maybe the CIP update may go better right adjacent to the uh, budget. Uh, so, so Bill, you're up. Excellent. Uh, good morning, all. Um, so there are two um, parts of the CIP topic that I wanted to draw your attention to. The first one deals with the five-year CIP that is in your packet, just following um, Casey's budget narrative. It, um, it supplements the information um, that Casey's already provided for this year uh, but expands, of course, beyond that to the next five years of what we're anticipating uh, would be the, the capital needs for that window of time. Um, as I've done in past years, I've also given you a glimpse of what years six through 10 might look like, depending on um, what, uh, what, what needs we, we see in those uh, uh, for, for other assets. So let me uh, briefly walk through that. Um, it's on page um, 29 of your uh, PDF packet uh, for those who have that available. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, information in here uh, matches what uh, Casey's already identified. Um, a couple of comments. Um, one, um, the gravity 
uh, flow station um, project uh, is, uh, as Casey alluded to, is um, we're proposing to cut that project short by ending it at 30% design um, this uh, next fall. Um, and the reason for that is uh, honestly the, the great success we had to uh, install the three new pumps at the pump station, uh, pump station one, which is right next to the office for Kenzie's benefit. Um, those um, pumps are so efficient that uh, we're expecting a 70% drop in electricity uh, and uh, annual electricity. And um, wh what that means, which is great, but what that means is that the benefits for, um, um, uh, for uh, draining water from the middle slough to the lower slough through the gravity flow stations uh, is less. Uh, we're, we don't have as much electricity to, um, um, to save because um, we've done a lot already, honestly, with those three um, primary workhorse pumps. Um, if we ever have to, when we have to turn on our big 700 horsepower or pumps, there are five pumps in that pump station, um, that's always going to be an um, uh, energy suck. But um, th those are rare when we turn those on. It has to be a mid to a pretty good sized storm. And of course, large design storms, you'd have to have those on. Any event, so um, the the uh, the reason for having um, um, the gravity flow station pipes, so the gravity pipes through the levee, to be um, functional enough to use frequently, is uh, no longer exists. Uh, we still need to use those pipes uh, as redundancy purposes for emergency um, um, suggest for emer emergencies, um, and uh, we still need to keep track of the condition of those pipes and eventually um, still talk about the possibility of putting some sort of fish barrier um, or, or other mitigation measure uh, at the outlet so uh, salmonoids can't swim back up into the middle slough. But um, we thought that uh, the, the best way to use your money and the loan, uh, the capital loan money is to redirect the money that we were gonna use on that project to a lot of those trash rate projects you heard Casey talk about. We're starting the design of those this next year, um, but the big money is coming in 2023 and 2024, as you see on the five-year CIP. Uh, and those projects do have a much, significant, much more significant impact on our operations um, uh, in terms of maintenance costs, as well as efficiency for, particularly for our operations team. Um, if you haven't been on the tour of, uh, and seeing um, the Broadmoor pump station and what our uh, operations crew does to rake the, uh, the debris grates that uh, is in front of the pumps. Um, please let me know because I'd love to take you out there to see what uh, the tightrope that they walk uh, to make sure that uh, they, can, um, they can pull debris out. Um, so that's one piece I wanted to highlight. The second piece I wanted to highlight, at least this next year, uh, are, the, are the vehicles, Casey was correct that um, we can't, um, uh, we want to be able to expend the money for the dump truck, um, the uh, new, um, uh, one of the new car vehicles, uh, sorry, new cars, um, as well as the barge replacement. Um, two of those items, the, the dump truck and uh, the spray truck, that was the other vehicle, uh, have been ordered, uh, but they just won't arrive before June 30 which means we don't expend the money until the next year. And so we've made progress on them, but we just haven't been able to expend the money uh, before June 30. So that's, the, that's why the shift there. And uh, I'm working with others to get some traction on the equipment barge, because that's been around for a, a year or two, and we want to make sure that that gets done next year. Uh, looking forward, uh, the, the remaining four years in that five-year CIP, um, and the big ticket item, of course, is the, the PMLS projects. Um, Casey's already alluded to that, and uh, we'll be talking about that more in the coming months. Um, Colin will have that information teed up uh, soon. Uh, other big projects that, uh, you, that should be on the, your radar, of course, the, uh, the straw pipe and McBride drainage pipe is one that uh, we'll continue to have conversations about. It's primarily about um, uh, at least initially, and what we're spending next year about is uh, outreach to landowners who are, um, who are benefiting from the straw pipe. 
and uh, how we can um, fund their contributions uh, to the project. So we've started talking about that um, and we still, uh, honestly with uh, Kadrin um, moving on, um, we just haven't been able to uh, have the horsepower to, uh, to make a lot of traction on that. So we should know more about that this summer. Uh, a couple other things to highlight. Um, I would like to conduct uh, a facilities master plan. We've done master planning work for the drainage systems. Uh, we have um, a surrogate master plan, if you will, and probably better than uh, in detail um, with the levy system, with the PMLS effort. Um, but we don't have a good grasp on master plans for our facilities, primarily our buildings, um, but also vehicles and so forth. Um, which circles back to the conversation we were just having, uh, you, all, you all were just having uh, about uh, remote work uh, and uh, how much physical space we should have on campus, um, not only for workstations, but for conference rooms and so forth. Um, so um, that's not starting this year, but I'm proposing that would start next year and finish up in 2024. The other larger um, ticket item um, that I would highlight is the a line called SCADA system upgrades. For those who have been around for a couple of years, that term may look familiar to you and, and it should. Um, that effort was in the past couple of years was to upgrade um, the communication system uh, of our SCADA system. And uh, that went from a cellular technology to a radio frequency technology. So now we have licensed radio frequency um, to uh, connect, um, be able to control our pump station remotely. Uh, recall that the cellular technology worked well until it rained, which is a problem for us because that's kind of what we do. Uh, and so we shifted gears on that. Uh, and uh, now we have a licensed radio frequency um, system, um, which is different than the unlicensed si uh, system we had decade or two prior to this. Uh, where PIR and the airports and others would override our, our, uh, our wavelengths and we couldn't connect to the pump stations. So now we have everything legit and we have a, a dedicated line um, to connect to our, our pump stations um, properly. This upgrade in 2023 focuses more on the PLC units, the program logic controls for those who um, don't think about the term PLC very often. Um, that is the physical unit inside the cabinet. So it's not the communication system, but the hardware um, that's the primary hardware that, that allows the, um, the tra that translates uh, the radio frequency into um, action at the pump station. So um, those PLC units we've milked for many, many years. And like other things you probably have seen in your own life, that at some point in time, uh, some things just no longer get serviced. And uh, the uh, Microsoft, uh, there's some things that uh, they just no longer uh, um, uh, support any longer. And if there's an error or, or something else comes up, they say, well, sorry, yeah, you have to buy this other model. We've come to that phase, uh, not only in MCDD, but all the districts. Uh, we try hard to use the same equipment. Um, and so if something goes out in one area, um, we can pull something off the shelf that's fairly um, standard for us and replace it in just about anywhere we have PLCs. So that's a sizable uh, amount, over $200,000 for your district. The other three districts also have um, um, money set aside at that point uh, or designated at least uh, for for those upgrades those were the two or three primary things i wanted to highlight about the cip similar to the budget um, my um, request will be that you um, uh, uh, review and um, approve the C five-year cip um, prior to approving the budget in at your january 29th meeting um, at our, your next meeting, uh, I'll have the full CIP package with a narrative. Basically, it'll be primarily this, these two pages of the spreadsheet. There'll be summary sheets uh, for each project like we've done in the past um, and a very, very similar looking um, narrative uh, that you had in past years with the exception of the last page, which is um, specific for the, the, uh, the outlook. That was a lot of words. I'm gonna stop there and uh, let you uh, ask any questions. Bill, question for you on um, 
the vehicle purchases. Do we have any plans to start to electrify some of the 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 smaller vehicles? Uh, the answer is yes, in part. Um, we are replacing, um, the first step is that we're replacing the, uh, the Chevy Tahoe, um, which has uh, been around for some time. Uh, staff has not been using um, the four wheel drive uh, of, for that vehicle um, to get onto levees. Um, we do have another, uh, we have a four by four pickup we can use instead. But we're, what we're doing is planning to replace that Tahoe with an electric vehicle and an electric charging station um, to, to install there. So that's our first step, Ken. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that the facilities master plan can, um, can help us further along in that direction. Nancy. Nancy. Thanks. Along those same lines, um, what is that? Um, CNG, I think, is the alternative fuel source for vehicles. Um, I think the port uses some of this, and the city is also using some of that coming, being produced out of the treatment plant, actually. So, um, and I understand that those are better for heavy vehicles, that kind of um, fuel source. So I'm just wondering, have, have you talked about that at all with your folks as we look to becoming more sustainable in the future? It's okay if you haven't, I'm just throwing Yeah, it. the short answer is no, we haven't yet. I know um, uh, I've had some very brief conversations with Corky in past about uh, transitioning old diesel engines into something that's more efficient. And uh, he has had some experience with some um, some grants to the EPA provides. Um, but the short answer is no, and that's something we need to we need to examine just like the electric vehicles for the office there. And Bill, the the light duty trucks, I I personally just put in a reservation for F-150 uh, Lightning. So, and they come out 2022, spring of 2022. So there's gonna be a lot of options that, that, enter, that EVs are changing dramatically in the next couple of years. So that's why I'd encourage um, to start to think about what can you electrify? What can you go to alternative fuels? Fair enough. I also the other think these conversations will also come up with the new district and their environmental committee as well. So it'll kind of help keep things moving forward. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it's given the new district's uh, mission. Uh, I think it's, we can be proactive about getting there, you know, while they're still farming and getting their bearings. Yeah, I'm, I'm also hoping that the facilities master plan can, can push that pretty hard as well. Okay, any, any other questions on the CIP? And yeah, well, again, we'll have another room to comment, ask questions for that before we we uh, do the final adopt adoption of it, right? Yes, sir. There's uh, you'll have the full packet at your next meeting to, to so another bite of the apple. Great. Well with that, um, I think you're back on for the assets and liabilities draft results. You no, know, if if you're willing, I'd like to um, just um, spend a moment or two just to add see if there's any questions that any of you have about the CIP updates. Those were the last eight pages uh, in your um, rather long packet this time around because of the, of the assets and liabilities report. Um, but the, those are the comments, or those are the updates for the eight um, capital projects you have ongoing this fiscal year. If you don't, what, we've covered some of those topics already. Um, the big ones, the vehicles and the, the gravity flow station are the two of the big ones, but um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Or I can just move on. <laughs> you know, Bill, and, that did bring up another question I had on the, uh, uh, the trash rake. Um, and I know we've talked about this before, so you just, just remind me as to why I, I know why we're not spending so much on it uh, this year, but the next year it's a jump again. Yeah. So um, there, there are phases of the trash. This 
the trash rig at pump station one has phases. Um, the primary system, the actual raking system was replaced this last year. And I believe um, Brian is gonna provide a, uh, a more thorough update, I think either your next meeting or in, in July. But what uh, didn't get touched um, was the conveyor system. So the, the, yeah. the, the rakes, rakes come down, pull up the debris and kind of pull it over the edge into a trough. And then for those who haven't seen it yet, there's basically a plow at one of the trough and just pushes all that debris down into a pit, a concrete pit. And from that concrete pit, we use our backhoe to scoop up and then put into the dump truck and away it goes. So that conveyor system and the plow or the, the, the operations uses a different term, um, is uh, of similar age um, and uh, needs some a, a lot of TLC maintenance wise. And honestly, that was of all the things that uh, OSHA um, uh, staff reviewed when I first got here and asked for a, uh, um, a voluntary um, review of all of our systems. That is the one safety issue that um, they brought up. We fixed the safety issue, um, and it's it's not a, it's not a problem anymore. But it's it could be better. Um, but it's it's twenty plus years old. It's a mechanical device. It's just time to 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 make a, to make uh, the upgrade. And because of the the opportunity to provide a slightly more safe working environment for our operation staff, I think it's appropriate to add it. That answer your question? Yeah, I, I recall now. Thank you. Yeah. I, I sorry, I did a little bit more just for the purposes of others who may not remember. Just for my awareness, Bill, for some of these other projects, also a result of that voluntary OSHA re review, like the ditch safety project. Uh, <laughs> by luck. Uh, Kenzie, that is probably the only other one that uh, they identified. Uh, they said um, that um, fall protection uh, at our culverts in particular are ones that we need to spend a little more time thinking about. There wasn't a particular um, OSHA um, standard uh, or uh, reference they can provide uh, except except for a general standard about when you need fencing. Uh, so it doesn't quite apply to us, but the spirit of the, of the law was, was there. And over the last five years, we've been making upgrades slowly to lots of our culvert um, sites. And you see a couple of others here in this, in this CID. Thanks. All right, any other questions? All right, moving on to the next item, assets and liabilities, draft results. Yeah, I'm afraid you have me for a whole bit while longer here. Oh, no, um, no, 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 Nancy's oh, got to go. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to suggest like a stretch break or something, or maybe a bio break, like three minutes. We can do that. How about we adjourn <laughs> at 12.05? Will that work? We come back together at 12.05? Yep. That would be great. Thanks, okay. Please, by the way. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Uh, and you'll find that uh, the uh, the numbers favor that. So that's that's good news for you. Um, yep. So uh, I'm here with uh, Jamie Damon, um, who is uh, part of the Kearns and West team, who is helping, who has helped us uh, with um, uh, helped us with uh, facilitating the board working group and just. Um, for general strategy for the project. Uh, so she's listening in and participating um, as needed today. Um, what I'm going to be offer showing you today is uh, a relatively short PowerPoint slide that provides an overview of the 140 page document that you received as a draft. Um, Hopefully you have a chance to at least glance at the executive summary, but if not, um, you'll be able to get the information uh, from these, this PowerPoint. Um, the, the intent here is to give you a, um, a starting glimpse of what this report entails uh, and ask questions and for us to make some adjustments. But what we would like to do um, is be in a position by the end of June, again at your June 29 format meeting, 
um, for you all to be comfortable with the contents to approve this report, um, and, as well as uh, the other three districts uh, in the same manner. Um, and as you will call or will see in here, um, the ORS 550 uh, requires this report as part of the transition from the current drainage districts to the new urban district. So um, it's a significant uh, milestone and I wanna make sure you all are comfortable with this. Um, so let me, uh, let me show, start a PowerPoint slide. I will share my screen. Are y'all able to see the screen still, the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Yeah, it looks good. Thanks. Um, so talking about uh, the assets and liabilities project, um, once again, um, the project deals uh, with the ORS reference um, to report um, all of your um, assets and liabilities uh, and duties, if you will, um, for um, your drainage district uh, and others. Um, and so this report provides that information. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, we had a group of uh, board members um, to help uh, give us some direction and, uh, and use as a sounding board. And Corky was your representative uh, on that uh, board working group. Uh, we were also um, uh, supported by, of course, Kearns and West. FCS group was the financial specialist um, that provides some um, some direction for us and Brown Caldwell provides some engineering support on asset management um, towards the end. Um, this is a image that's uh, or, or a Gantt chart that you've seen in past, um, pretty straightforward, we've been able to accomplish um, what we needed. Uh, we did not need to go through some meetings related to the valuation methods. We were able to do that early, blend that information earlier. And so now we're here in May and um, and reporting out uh, what we've been able to find. So the draft report uh, entails uh, this uh, table of contents. There's a two plus page executive overview. Um, there's a purpose and background um, section. Uh, Hong had a, a chance to uh, draft uh, the duties of the drainage districts. Um, and um, we follow that up with definitions um, that you all had seen back in January. Um, Nick uh, was able to uh, pull together information from our, um, uh, our audit reports from uh, FY 1920, which are the ones that just were, were just finished um, to put together um, the summary that's in this report. And, and I myself and a number of other staff were able to um, give you a glimpse of not only the, uh, of the intangible assets uh, that, that you uh, own, um, but also the, um, the capital improvements that staff anticipates the new district will have to face in the coming, uh, coming months or coming years once they're, they're, uh, they've started. Um, the duty section re references uh, the definition of the duties are legal commitments or legal expectations to act. Um, they're determined by the exercise of your discretionary authority, statutory authority, as well as powers uh, to accomplish those purposes. Um, that particular section of the report uh, is broken out into four sections, four components. Um, there's references and discussion about the rec your original reclamation plans, um, as well as the district formation records. Um, there are plans reports that uh, the chief engineers over time have uh, identified as um, applicable for um, your, uh, uh, not only for current, but for future use. Um, we have contracts with the federal government. Every time um, the federal government comes in and helps improve the levy system, there are contracts um, that you sign with them to say, yep, we acknowledge this and we'll continue to maintain them to your standards. Um, but also there's a section about board resolutions, which also contributes to the um, concept of duties that the new urban district would have to uh, reference. The definitions are ones that you've seen before. Um, uh, back in January, uh, it references what an asset is and a liability is. Um, 
are, excuse me, and um, remember these are fairly traditional definitions um, of what those terms are and particular focus on, on finance or accounting um, um, perspective, excuse me. The asset valuation method is one that we discussed back in January as well. Uh, and we you agree that we could use this original cost less depreciation concept. Turns out it's the same method that we use in the, um, the audit, independent auditors use for our, our rep, uh, annual reports, which is great. Um, fairly straightforward. You identify what the original cost is and you depreciate annually uh, over the course of the, of the years that we, they've had it. Um, other methodologies uh, really depend on the source of the engineering documents, um, and we can get into those a little later. This is a glimpse of what uh, the assets and liabilities uh, and the net are, not only for your district, but for the other districts. Um, again, you're on the positive, you're in the black, so that's a good thing. Um, by, uh, by 8 million, your liabilities is significantly higher, partly because of capital loans, but also um, quite a bit um, because of you're the only one who has employees um, and none of the other three districts do. So that's primarily why there's a, a difference there. Um, as I referenced, um, it's important to note that this information is based on um, what the auditors had through June of 2020. Some of the other um, data that uh, is in the report has different uh, are, 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 are current estimates. So I want to make sure I highlight those as I go along because they're not all in 2021 dollars or 2021 situations. Other considerations, um, I referenced that there was, uh, you also have intangible assets. That's something the ORS um, requires us to uh, highlight. Um, you are the only one that has uh, a water right uh, and uh, we, you still own it. But in addition, there are over 700 easements and deeds that the four districts combined uh, have on our books and have been recorded. Um, but there's also a series of other um, considerations or other uh, known capital needs that um, the staff is aware of. And we feel that the uh, new urban district should consider as they uh, examine revenue uh, tools for, for to continue operations. One of course is the, uh, the CORE's Portland Metro Levy System or PMLS projects. Um, currently the estimates for the local match, this is not the total project, but the local match is 5.6 million for design or PED. Uh, and then over over 44 million for construction. Again, this is um, these this is system wide, so it's for all four districts, not just for MCPD. Um, as Casey referenced earlier, you will have a um, probably several opportunities to talk with your um, your partner districts about how to allocate that money across the four districts. Um, there's as you remember as well, there's uh, levies accreditation that's still in the in the ether and we still want to move forward on that. Um, we're at a stage now, or the LRC group is at a stage now that uh, they're examining different um, project work scopes to accomplish those. Some of those projects are folded into the PMLS projects, um, but the others um, are still need to be done. And depending on what scope, final scope, um, is considered for each of those other projects. Uh, the range could any, be anywhere from 10.5 to almost $24 million. So wide range um, and more information is to become after the multi-benefits uh, analysis is done. Um, and you all have a chance to, and the rest of the LRC group has had a chance to examine the results. Beyond those two, um, staff spent a, a fair amount of time on the next two items. And I wanted to highlight, this is the 20 year outlook of what the urban district would see as they start. So the, this 20 year horizon starts in FY 2026, uh, ends in FY um, 2045. And um, I differentiated between major capital and operating capital um, some based on some conversations Peggy and I have had um, but for purposes of this conversation, um, the major capital represents individual projects that are over a million dollars in cost. 
those projects or um, individual asset replacements or rehab that are under a million dollars in costs fall under operating capital. And so what I was trying to do here is to have the new urban districts start thinking about, well, could there be some different um, revenue sources or revenue tools that can address both uh, or each of them? Um, so the, the second, first one being really significant ones, they're, fairly, they're, they're a limited number of projects. The uh, second one is uh, kind of ongoing capital needs uh, over the course of years. I broke it up into two 10 year cycle uh, segments, um, but in any event, so um, more information on that in the next slide. The final thing, uh, as you all know, is that um, we work um, to make sure the system um, uh, functions properly. Um, but as you well know, the uh, system uh, is fairly complex, particularly with asset ownership. Um, is we basically own none of the levy. Uh, that's land that's owned by private property owners uh, or the public agencies. Um, we own pump stations, at least many of them. And uh, we own almost none of the pipes uh, with, a, with a few exceptions. Um, or, and say, same thing with the ditches. So we have to rely quite a bit on partnerships with the city, with the ports, with other private property owners to make sure the system um, functions properly. Um, and we know that uh, through our drainage master plan work and some of the other um, planning studies is there's a handful um, and more of projects that uh, should be on the urban district's radar moving forward. Great example would be the culvert under Northeast 82nd Avenue um, as part of the, it's kind of a secondary slough, but it's not in good shape. Um, so that needs, we need to pay attention to that. That I believe that road is um, maintained and, and owned by ODOT. Marine Drive is another one out in SDIC. There's a double barrel culvert underneath um, that area and um, that um, anecdotally it's part of the culverts that are held up by two by fours which is not an engineering approach to uh, keep a, a pipe stable so that needs to be addressed uh, moving forward uh, in order to come up with the uh, operating capital requirements we um, identify all of our 1700 assets um, put together SMA useful lives and costs for replacement and rehab and came up and like many other asset management efforts that you probably seen your own organizations, um, you can do a forecast of what type of uh, capital needs are there. Um, this is a, a, an example of that forecast. This will be adjusted uh, as we continue to refine our, um, our estimates, but like many forecasts, there are waves of, of capital ex, uh, expenditures that are anticipated over the year. So, you know, one scenario is that uh, you build, you establish a capital reserve um, that you continue to contribute over time. Um, and so you don't have to make significant peaks, uh, increases in assessments or rates um, when those, those things come up. Next steps, um, we're finalizing the reports. Uh, we're gathering input, sorry about that. Um, and um, we'll have another group meeting potentially in mid June and Corky will have a chance to uh, hear about not only what's happened here, but other three district um, meetings that we're, we're having over these next couple of weeks. Uh, and then finally, a recommendation to you all back in um, your June 29th meeting to approve and finalize the report. So with that, um, I believe that's, that was my last slide. Um, Corky, do you have any um, thoughts to, to share with the group as a representative from the board working group? and? Um, things that they may want to think about and um, as we consider approving this in the near future. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Thanks. Uh, the PMLS projects is probably the, and uh, in, in how that is balanced between the different districts. I mean, the, the whole idea of doing an assets and liability analysis back before we got a bill through the state legislature was uh, so that each of the districts could say, well, look, I, I, I've taken care of my levies pretty well and they don't require uh, so much improvement uh, 
to meet uh, Army Corps and, and FEMA standards. Um, in the case of PIN 1, for example, we know we, we've always known we have a problem there. Um, and we know that that's going to cost more. So somebody in Sandy, for example, may not feel like they should be paying for the PIN 1 improvements. So that was the concern there. And we still don't really have a good sense of how that balances out moving forward. Um, maybe it's no longer an issue between the districts, but I suspect it still is. So on that note, it's, it seems to me like this assets and liabilities report um, is information for that discussion, right? Because it doesn't make any recommendations for that kind of discussion. That is, cor that is correct, Nancy. And the other thing I see is that what this really does, this effort and doing it now helps to A, open the conversation, have the data prepared, which we didn't have in advance, and provide a foundation for the revenue development efforts with the new district. They have a base, they have a foundation to start their process. But the question's gonna come up because it's already been raised more than once. That, More than 20 times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that doesn't count where, you know, what your radar is picking up. This is just verbal words that it is, it's, it's going to be part of the discussion. But until you get the data in front of everybody, you really can't, where do you start? And, uh, and, I, and I, Nancy, I think you put it well. I, I wish I'd put it that well. Uh, I think what this does is it looks back and says, okay, where, where are we up to today? Uh, with our assets and liability. And it does a really, I think it does a very good job of kind of laying that all out there. And it, it, from that point forward, moving forward in the future, we're going to have a lot of discussion and, and perhaps some disagreements. But at least we can probably with this agree on where we are up to today. Does, is, Bill, is that a fair analysis of it? Yes, uh, that, that was our hope. Um, but not only with the assets and liabilities, but also the foundation from which those asset and liabilities um, grow out of, which is the duties, which are the duties that your current district and the new district will have, will be, uh, um, you know, need to, need to, accomplish, to address. So along those lines, so also this is not revenue, predicted revenue requirements, this is assets and liabilities, because there's a whole bunch of revenue that's not included in here, or expenditures and revenue. Absolutely, but what you have to, you at least have to know what is your operating capital requirements. If you've got a general idea of what your potential capital investments are, it begins to um, develop an understanding of what your um, obligations are gonna be and liabilities are down the road. And um, it also, is a starting point to understand levels of service based on available assets. So it's, it's, it kind of starts that foundation work from my perspective. So can I add one thing, Bill, if you're allowed? And correct me, Hong, but it's important to know coming into this for, for me that the assets and liabilities of this project says that the urban board might consider these later on when they set rates. It doesn't say they have to, it doesn't say how they're going to. But it's kind of important to me, it's a key concept that the urban board will might eventually consider the differences in assets and liabilities between the four districts and whether or not it makes sense to adjust the rates accordingly. And I'll jump in ahead of Hong. I think this begins that very conversation of looking where the differential is. It may mean one approach may be that they do rates a little differently for the first few years and level them out. They may, they may make a decision that they want um, their, uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest conversations they're gonna have is how do we, how do we use this information potentially for rates? Also, yeah. <laughs> I also think there's an application as you 
the budgeting years as it lead, leads up to the new district as well, because uh, SDIC has a positive balance on the, the books. Um, and uh, a lot of that is anticipating future capital costs. Mm -hmm. But but if if there, you know, there may be discussion about, do you draw that down over the next few years? Yeah, I think, I think Nancy, you know, astutely laid out sort of the framework for, for what this report should serve uh, in going forward. Because remember, we we're here because there were a few members of certain um, boards that wanted to figure out if there's an, a, a need to level the playing field and shore up um, any uh, assets and liabilities that may exist between the district. And, and I think Bill and, and, um, and has done a fabulous job of sort of keeping the eye on, on the, the, the future, the goal to avoid the legal conflicts. Cause I don't think you want to get into the legal conflicts of fighting over what the assets and liabilities are or, or uh, with respect to the, the, the inter-district issue. The goal is, um, and, and I would look to the, the board members here uh, to, to encourage uh, focusing on what, how the new district can resolve these, these issues so that we don't get into inter-district liability and assets issues. Otherwise, we're, it, it may not happen, you know, or it's going to be a tough road to get there. And so if we can repeat the, um, and remind folks that we're presenting this objective information to the urban district, they can choose to allocate in, in um, um, the, uh, the new fees how they want. But if we look to them, they'll be the one that's going to able, be able to resolve the conflicts. And, um, and it, it'll be those board members that will, will work within that entity. We don't need, as, as the four districts, need to get into that fight. So, um, it's, it's, so I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great effort to present as objectively as possible uh, the factual information to date. The other thing that I noticed, um, maybe I'm the only one that was surprised, but pen one is in the black. Just the way we've been talking about it over the years, I didn't expect to see that. So I think that's a really good sign. And I mean, they're in the, all of them are in the black. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the city of Portland's contribution to that pen one. And it's probably important to note, they're in the black when you compare assets to liabilities, right? Because that's what the balance sheet does. What you're really thinking of with Pen One is probably on a year-to-year -year basis, Pen One struggles with having revenue to meet its expenditures, which is a slightly different question. Well, and the bigger issue is going to be, it's where we are right now, but when you look at the future, obligations and liabilities, things don't look quite as, as balanced. So I, I bring up the um, project here today just to give you an introduction of it. Um, offer uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions or, or even topics that you think I may not have or our team is not really explored as well as you would maybe would have liked to see in something like this. Um, and so um, when uh, you'll have actually another chance to comment on this at your next meeting in, uh, in the, towards the mid, in mid June, I believe, um, if uh, and we can make potentially some, some uh, final adjustments there. Um, but if there's anything you, you see there that uh, you'd like for us to explore, I would very much appreciate uh, those comments now. Otherwise, I recognize you haven't had a lot of chance to look through the report yet. It's pretty lengthy, um, and um, there's a lot of detail in there. For so for some, and you may not need to get into all those details. But um, uh, yeah, uh, please reach out to me uh, through uh, through Emily um, and uh, and Jim to uh, provide any additional feedback if you didn't have any today. And can Bill, I just can I? Oh, go ahead. Oh, Bill, Bill, in that report, did it did it 
just identify assets and liabilities or did it identify any assets we may have that maybe we want to dispose of in the future? Um, can you give me an example? Well, do we have any excess land or buildings um, that we would, we're not using and we would want to get rid of as we go through this process? Yeah, good, good call. Um, honestly, you don't, uh, but Pen2 might have some, uh, uh, some land that I'm not quite sure why they own. Um, so that's a possible possibility for them to, um, um, to dispose of that land. Um, so there are graphics uh, so in the appendices, Ken, that uh, can help you identify some of those pieces in there. I didn't list all 1,700 assets in the report. I, su I suppose I can do that if you think it's appropriate for the record. Uh, we do have the list of uh, assets that, are in, that were used as part of the um, uh, for, for the uh, auditor's report. So I guess I'll, I'll re retract my previous statement. There's the, we do have the, a list of assets and liabilities in there. Uh, it's not as quite as detailed as the, uh, the asset management program has. So um, the information's there. Um, one would have to take another step or two of interpretation, Ken, in order to say, um, do we really need these assets or, and, or should we have a conversation about disposing them? The land is a good example. Water right might be another example, so on and so forth. I just think it might be valuable as you go through the urban districts formed and you may have assets that may not serve any purpose and you want to dispose of it and they cost you money to maintain, so. Is it fair to assume that the methodology um, used to forecast capital needs in the future is um, standard across all of the districts? That's a good assumption. Uh, in fact, it is exactly what we use for all the districts. Um, and I referenced Brown and Caldwell early in the uh, presentation. Um, part of their responsibility for this project was to give us industry standards of how to estimate um, useful life uh, for an asset, um, regardless where, the, where it's located. Thanks. Right, any other questions? No, I, uh, one more observation that's uh, uh, might be worth noting. Uh, you know, when we look at the net position on each of the di districts, you know, they're all in the black um, and, and that's great. And MCD ha has the best net position, but if you break that down per acre, which I have not done, but if you broke that down per acre, it probably would, it might be the worst. Um, <laughs> just worth having in mind. Is there any, so with that respect, um, perspective, would it be a value to add that type of, uh, that, that type of information in this report? Or is that something you think it's appropriate for someone else to do using this report information? I think it gets tricky. Uh, well, the whole thing's had, it's been tricky at several points along the way. And I think this would be another point where that, that gets a little tricky because do you do it per acre, for example, or as Nick brought up just a little while ago, in terms of what, um, where, what are my resources for my income resources? Who's going to pay for it? You know, mm. um, MCDD is, is certainly in better position than the tax, what's the tax base? MC is a better position than uh, um, than one, for example. So uh, I think that that question, Bill, probably is better answered later on. Now you just provide them the raw number and somebody else further down the road can say, okay, I want to divide that raw number by acres or by tax base or whatever. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and I think that just starts that conversation that uh, we just talked about what's going to happen at Urban Flood Safety Water Quality District. But the piece you said, Bill, about including all the assets, I think in, it should be part of the record somewhere, if that means an appendice or something, just somewhere where it's accessible, easily accessible. Yeah, and um, so the 1700, the, the version of the assets and liabilities, primarily assets, I guess, um, that the 20-year that the forecast 
uh, was based upon is not in the appendices, but the version of the assets and liabilities that was based on the auditor's report are in the appendices. In the appendices, so um, it's it's a level of detail, I guess, on what I'm getting at. Um, and so, give it a little more thought. It's not an issue to add um, more pages to a PDF file. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, look, take a look at uh, the assets that are there in Appendix C, I think it is, um, and uh, see if that's adequate for you. And, and to add just a, one thing, Bill, if I could, the assets that are included, um, all the assets that meet the, the financial definition, the accounting definition of assets are included already. So the hard assets was, was not included. Uh, I don't know, work in projects, work in projects, capital needs, other things, but all the assets that meet the current accounting definition are listed already. Correct. And an example of the differences, uh, difference between the two, Nancy, would be, think of a pump station. Well, the, what's in the, the assets, uh, what, what's in the, in the uh, 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 sorry, the um, auditor's report is one line, pump station two, right? Well, there are a lot of things that are part of a pump station. And so in the assets liabilities piece, we talk about there's a pump, there's, um, there's a motor, there's electrical system, there are pipes, blah, 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 blah. So there may be a dozen things that are part of that pump station or more in many cases. And then the, uh, the version that is in the appendices, there's one line item. And Nick, are you using this information to update the asset registry for the districts? This information basically came from the asset registry. Every year, our staff updates the asset registry, shares it with the auditors, and then the auditors go through and test certain additions and deletions for, you know, for reasonableness. And that becomes part of the, that the, the total of the asset registry goes into the audit report as our current list of capital assets. And you didn't find any hidden assets when you're going through this process? Long story short, there was at least, a, there was quite a few, uh, not hidden, but there was, and, and Bill can help me out, probably 20 to 30 assets that over the many years have unclear ownership. And I summarized those with Bill's help into a list of, I think, 10 or 11 that have, I would just say, unclear ownership. And, and those are included in there as one of the appendixes, just to point them out. Obviously, many of them you know about. Uh, the Sandy Gate Tower has completely unclear ownership is, is the biggest one. But there are several like that, that we included as an appendix that I think are all well known. And we don't want to try to say for sure who owns them because we're not sure. And, and the reverse happened as well. So we know there are some assets that are not on the books that we're pretty sure it's the, uh, that we own. And so we're having that discussion internally of how best to handle that to, um, to address that in the next auditor's round. And the next, there's the 10 or 11 significant ones are included as in one of the appendixes. Great. Well, it looks like we're right at our agenda time. So I suggest we move on. If there's any other questions, we can, we can uh, uh, talk about that in the next, next time you bring this up, which is, is it next month or wh what's your timing? Yeah, you have a meet, uh, Emily, there's, they have a, board meeting in mid-June sometime on 20th or in that vicinity? It would be at yes. that meeting. It's going to be, I think, yeah, the 24th. Okay, 24th. That will be good. Um, admittedly, I haven't gone through every page on this, so I need to do a little more research. <laughs> and so I think all of us will need to read up and bring additional questions when we hear it the next time. Um, and please email me ahead of time too. Um, there's not a lot of days between 24th and 29th, uh, so I want I want to get it out, uh, the next version out uh, to the whole all four districts. So feel free to reach out to us uh, through Emily um, when uh, when questions come up. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, moving on. We're one minute behind, uh, but I know Hong's going to make up for it. So. Uh, MCDD Urban Service Agreement, uh, the IGA that, that uh, you're working on. Huh. Right, so a little lighter than assets and liability and uh, lighter for many reasons. Um, it, it will go over the framework of an IGA that you are already familiar with. Um, I believe, Emily, was there a PowerPoint 
thought there was a PowerPoint, but as she is looking at that, um, I'll direct you to the meeting materials where there was a one pager um, uh, overviewing the issues and then attached to that is a draft IGA. So um, this is an IGA in which uh, MCDD will be uh, directly contracting with the urban district to provide uh, support to the urban district. Currently, uh, MCDD staff is providing support to the urban district through the JCA. Uh, and we do that because there was half a million dollars uh, of state grant that we needed to, to, to expend and the money was granted to the JCA. So I believe um, a little less than a year ago um, in 2020, um, the JCA approved that service agreement and staff has been operating under that service agreement. This agreement will be a direct contract with the urban district and MCDD. And really it's, it's all, um, we modeled it with the, uh, we modeled it from the JCA agreement and a lot of the, everything is pretty much the same in that, um, following that, that agreement from the scope of work to uh, identification um, and usage of officers and, and employees of MCDD uh, to how we are going to be compensated for the work. And the fact that um, this agreement uh, between us and urban district, there's a common legal interest um, so that there is no, um, to establish that there's no legal conflicts. Um, I'll just highlight that, that, that the common interest, the common legal interest between the two, two districts is just to see the urban district get set up and formed and um, mature through the initiation organization phase so that it can do, do its work, which is to develop the revenue. Um, so just walking through uh, the quickly through the IGA, uh, the general service that we are going to be doing is providing administrative support uh, with the goal of advancing through the urban district's organization phase. So we will be providing staff, we will be helping with contracts, entering through contracts, everything that we currently do for our sister districts, we're going to be doing for the urban district. Um, he, with respect to officers and employees, the current MCDD ED Will, will serve as the urban district um, executive director. No change there. Um, the services that we are providing to the urban district will be at the direction of the urban district board, um, overseen by the executive director of the urban district and MCDD, which is all in one person. Um, and given the, the, the dual roles um, that's why it's important for us to recognize that we're all doing this under a common legal interest, which is to whatever conflicts there are, we're advancing it to meet the, the, the organization phase um, of the urban district. I see uh, Emily is starting to share the screen, but I'll just continue on here. Uh, for compensation, um, no different from how we're uh, servicing our other sister districts. We're going to invoice them for the work that we're doing. Um, the thank you, Emily. You can just leave it right there. I'm on section five. Um, we'll be invoicing the um, the urban district, and the difference here is currently with the JCA agreement, um, and we are not charging the urban district for overhead. The reason behind that was because we wanted to op optimize the $500,000 grant from the state and get as much out of it as possible. In the current um, proposal here, as I understand, and, and Peggy can provide input as, as appropriate, um, we will be charging the urban district for overhead, for MCCDD's overhead, um, just as, as we do with the other sister districts. So, Every year at the end of the fiscal year, this board approves a rate, a service rate um, of, of staff's rates and, and overhead percentage. And then we propose that to the sister districts to whom we provide service. Um, and they pay and they, uh, through that, they approve it. And so they agree to pay that rate. We plan to do the same 
uh, with respect to the services we provide to the urban district. Um, insurance and indemnity, uh, we will have um, here, we just agree that we will uh, be responsible or the, the two districts are mutually responsible for their own um, claims uh, resulting from their own actions. So that's a very typical uh, reciprocal indemnity provision um, and that we will have insurance for our work. Uh, finally, with respect to the termination paragraph, um, it is it, we could terminate, either party can terminate this arrangement in writing um, if there's, um, and so that's, that's um, it, sort of the voluntary termination. Um, if there is no termination prior to us finishing our work, this relationship will terminate um, upon consolidation of the four drainage districts. Uh, with that, before I leave the slide, if Emily, can you go up to the second slide number two? And just for Kenzie's, um, this is really for Kenzie's education. Um, right here, Kenzie, you'll see um, Multnomah County drainage district is in that blue box at the bottom. All these lines here represent contractual agreements we've had with all of these other districts in which we provide service. Um, the, the current relationship we have with the urban district right now, uh, there's a big arrow that goes up in the middle from the urban district through the JCA through, uh, through to the urban district. And that's, a, that's another contracting layer that we're gonna to try to get away from to help with finance, manage, uh, finance and administrative work. So this agreement here is that, uh, that light blue line that runs up to the left side from Multnomah County directly up to the urban district. Um, we have presented, so I'm, I'm done with the slide. Thank you, Emily. We presented this, this draft agreement to the urban district, was it last week, two weeks ago? I don't know, very recently. And all the board meetings are getting um, overlapping here. Um, week and a half ago. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so we proposed the same um, set of terms and we haven't heard anything from them. My goal is for us to um, get their approval on this or get approval for them to sign and execute this at the June board meeting, at their June board meeting, and similarly get um, approval from this board for its execution um, or in significantly similar form at your June board meeting so that then we can start uh, directly billing the work uh, to the Ermid district the money that's going to be paid for uh, the work will be the urban district funds. It won't be the state um, the state money that was granted to the JCA. And um, the urban district just received a, a six million dollar loan. Thank you, Nancy, um, from the the city of Portland uh, to fund the operating expenses next year. So there will be money for work to be done. And I would add one thing that the second slide, which showed connection, there is potential money left over from the um, state grant. So the districts, the district will still use that mechanism until those funds are expended. But as Hong indicated, the new district has received a $6 million line of credit from the city of Portland for the over the next five years and have the capacity to draw on that line of credit um, of $1.2 million a year. And that will be how that new district will pay MCDD staff. And and Peggy, um, is that the is is that also the money to pay for the new urban district project manager position that was referenced in Casey's budget? Yes. So that um, loan, and, and I understand it's it's Plan B in, in case some money from the legislature doesn't come through, but that will be a loan that urban flood service district will carry. And so it won't be counted against MCDD's liabilities during right. yeah. and, I, and, I'll, and I'll address that um, in a little more detail, Nancy. That $6 million loan, um, there is a caveat in that agreement 
that that six million dollars can be or could be reduced by the amount if the state legislature gives them two million dollars, the new district, then the amount of the loan would go from four from six to four. So there's a, a balancing act, but yeah. Yeah, we'll be happy to take a grant that as the uh, we made that really clear. We, we made that really clear because uh, free money <laughs> is better than when you have to pay interest on it. But the beauty, at least with a line of credit, is you only pay interest on the amount that you withdraw. So um, that was the reason that um, I worked with Mike in, around that issue. So. Yeah, it's Peggy is Mike Jordan. Don't thank me for that. <laughs> Peggy, on on that, um, the state's slated to get a, a slug of federal cash with the American Rescue Plan. Any any of that? Any chance any of that can get allocated? Um, at this point, we don't know. We've been working. Um, Evan and um, Colin have been having those discussions at this point, it is unclear, um, but I, I may be a little more optimistic than others and that even if we can't tap into that, it provides the state more money and, and more flexibility to maybe reach in a little deeper on our behalf. So we're still working that, that, um, that effort, but we don't have any clarity at this point. It's it's unclear with Mark and Mark has said the same thing. How about with the infrastructure talks in DC? Is there, is there any? We are working. Yeah, we're still working. Um, no clarity. We're still working with um, um, Julie Minerva on that very issue. And if, um, if Colin is on the line or Evan, they may be able to give you a little more detail. As Colin, um, I can jump in with a little bit more. So um, for our current requests in uh, DC, they, they don't meet the, um, the new earmark policy, at least for this year. Um, and the intention is that there will be subsequent years. And I think we'll try to position ourselves to be included in um, an earmark request from um, uh, the Oregon delegation, uh, however that may look. Uh, there's a lot of other money that's coming in uh, that we're tracking. Um, FEMA has started a new um, grant program or, uh, that includes some local match that's required. That is similar to um, sort of great recession recovery that those are a little bit closer to quote unquote shovel ready and you need to have your um, cash contribution ready to go and actually approved. Um, but I think there are gonna be other uh, projects that um, we might be able to tap into some of the money. And then I think Peggy made a really great point where uh, overall, especially on um, hazard mitigation and resiliency work, uh, money coming into the state where the state actually is the steward of the money and can uh, allocate it sort of as they see most eff effective. So uh, we'll continue to try to position ourselves. Um, but I think the biggest opportunity is probably um, for asking for support and potential funding uh, for the um, Portland Metro levy study project. Great, thank you. Any other additional questions? All right, and uh, so this will come next month again, we, we're gonna have a full agenda next month, it looks like. Um, so this will come next month and uh, any feedback, you're welcoming any feedback between now and then, right? Correct. Okay. All right, let's move on to executive session, uh, unless anybody else has any questions. All right, I, th I think we're ready to move into executive session. So I'm gonna read this off, um, stop the recording. Executive session basis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
you're dealing with a somewhat rookie president here. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we are about ready to go into executive session. The MCDD board will now enter executive session per, pursuant to ORS 40.255 or ORS 192.3559A and 192.6602F for the purposes of discussing confidential legal advice and attorney-client attorney communication not related to litigation. Now you can turn the recording off. You You're last. To, yeah, you have oh, to get well, out Hang of. on. I, I, yeah, I think, Ken, if you can just announce uh, the end of the executive session um, and, All right. and back into public session, that would be great. So this is the end of the executive session and now we're back into a uh, session and we're on uh, the executive director update and new business. And this we've already covered some of it, which I just wanted to talk, you know, give you an update on the $6 million line of credit from the, from, um, the city of Portland and that they've signed, they signed, um, the city council approved and the urban flood district approved. So that line of credit is in place. I anticipate them taking their first draw on the 1st of July. Um, the next thing they they are also going through, um, they have a, they've approved their budget. Then the budget needed to go with you folks that are used to working in the public sector in Multnomah County, it has gone it was sent ahead of schedule, thanks to um, Casey, um, to the TSCC board for review and um, the hearing for that budget certification by TSCC is the afternoon of June 3rd, Thursday of next week. They will go through adopting their budget on June 21st. And um, so, there and and I assume at that time they will approve taking their first draw of the city city funds and um, just a reminder though you probably don't need to be reminded Jim starts Jim Mida your new executive director starts on Tuesday of next week um, and we're very excited to have him looking forward to it he's already been on campus once and and met some of the staff and, and met all the operations team. And um, he will, um, I will be with a week with him next week um, as I'm available. And then I will also be available for work through the June 15th, just to help him get set up, answer questions, um, prepare some documents that I don't think he needs to do and I can do at this point in time as as a I never can say this word is the is it emer when you're the emeritus emeritus that's right I never can say it correctly um, and um, so I just the districts are going to be adopting their budget as you know at the end of the month then um, next year is going to be interesting with a PMLS and PED. So that's that's all I got to say. And it has been a pleasure working for this board and with this organization. I feel I was asked by someone the other day, what is one of... What is one of the most important things you've, decisions you've made over your life? Can't be marriage, can't be kids. So that kind of clears off the, you know, clears all the perfunctory things we feel we need to say. And I had to admit, I said, you know, it was taking this job on with the Multnomah County Drainage District. It has been exciting. It has been stretched me in every direction. I've never worked with a, in my 40 some years, um, a professional 
work. I have never worked with a more dedicated and focused and smart group of people, whether it is the board members, staff, etc. So I thank you for the privilege of being able to have this job over the last 18 months. But I will also be thinking of you when I'm sitting on my deck drinking a margarita. So there you go. <laughs> Peggy, huh? we really appreciate you. And I know when we offered you the job, you had no idea that we would have a hundred year pandemic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, everything else that came at us in 2020 and early mm -hmm. 2021. Um, so we really appreciate your guidance, leadership, and just, just man, it, it's been a tough year for a lot of people and and uh, we needed somebody to be steady at the helm and get us through this this trying times and it happened to hit right when we're trying to just start up a new district um, you know so there, there there's uh, so many different things that happened while you were the executive director and um, you handled it uh, great and you're going to leave a great legacy. So I uh, just wanted to tell you, thank you very much. And most importantly, thank you for your friendship too. Um, you you uh, have been a great leader and I've learned from you and, uh, and I, I hope to join you one day. It's going to be a little while on my trotting off into the sunset with a, a state <laughs> <laughs> nice and warm <laughs> well i just want to extend the first of all thank you ken but second of all if you're ever down in near santa fe look me up there's always a place on the porch to watch the sunsets and feed horses and chickens and um shoot the proverbial so i'd like to to make a comment um, uh, with respect to this board, uh, you know, as you know, Peggy reports to you, I report to you. Uh, you it's a unique position. Um, and with that, I think it, I had in Peggy a true partner in, in us working together. I mean, we definitely had differences in opinion. We also had lots of opinions that were aligned and um, she was a true professional. Um, and I really appreciate um, the, the efforts that she put into the, the relationship and, and us working together and being aligned um, as before we came to you and, and do this, this wonderful presentations that we do to you every month and, and to all the other districts. So I, I'm looking forward to, to Jim coming in, but, but certainly um, Peggy was really a, a true partner in this. So I, I wanted to, to thank her for that. Thank you, Hong. I appreciate it. It has been a good partnership. Yeah, it was it was a little bit of a strange position, you know, kind of an interim position, and you were a perfect fit for it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> that that was let's just say the last 18 months has been Mr. Toad's wild ride. So. <laughs> That is I think true. We told you that in advance. <laughs> Are you going to name one of your horses, Mr. Toads? <laughs> no, my my mayor would be offended, and the old man would be really pissed off. <laughs> um, but but we can't say there won't be a chicken or two that could be could be dubbed that name. <laughs> well, it's, it's an actual ride at, at Disney. Yeah. Land. Yeah, and it, it, it goes yeah. up and it's it's a it's an absolutely crazy ride even though you're on a track you feel like you're going to get thrown off but but in some ways i i think i think the analogy is appropriate with 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 the turmoil uh, to some extent of 2020 from the social injustice to the fires to all of that that as we felt like we were thrown off um i truly do do believe that it's it's Peggy's leadership and 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 ability to hold it all together for us externally and internally administratively and and I and I saw that every day um, you know dialing in and coming to work I mean certainly um, there 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 were controversies and and, and not all decisions were made uh, that you know made everybody happy but that's that's what is being a true leader is to make 
concise decisions that hold it and keep it together. And I, I couldn't imagine um, a better person to have gone through <laughs> this, this really tough year and a half than with Peggy. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to miss the big retirement set off, send off when we all do funny skits about you, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better be ready to use four letter words because I speak quite frequently, unfortunately. <laughs> There's one thing I'm not, I'm not, I, it is not my attribute is being quiet about. <laughs> I thought we were going to take a field trip to her pl new place. And there you go. Ooh, yeah, there you go. There there you go. go. The next board meeting down yeah. there. <laughs> 18 acres you can put up a, you can put up a tent or get in the barn or sleep on a floor there's plenty of options <laughs> and good beer down the road yeah we've really appreciated you um steering the ship peggy this last thank you while it's it's been wacky but <laughs> it has been but hey we're all still standing, so that's a good thing. So thank you. And definitely, and you know, keep in touch. We uh, would love to hear from you, and I'm coming down, so you're gonna have to give me a spot in that barn or something. So <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty of space. There's plenty of space. That's the good thing about moving somewhere where people like to go, is you. People are more apt to come visit. So I think I'm going to get a visit from Corky in the next month or two and his family. So there you go. Great. Well, any other parting thoughts? I have one thing. Um, last week I sent you all the information for Hong's performance evaluation. So I just want to make sure you all have seen that and you can just communicate directly with Tracy. Um, but I just wanted to keep that on your radar for that timeline. Thank you, I'm on. Mm -hmm. Great, and yeah, that's a good good one. Uh, Hong touched on it, but Hong reports directly to the board. So keep that in mind as you do the performance appraisal. All right, if I don't hear anything else, I'm gonna adjourn this meeting. Uh, I think we're three minutes late, but we did pretty good given all the content we had on it. <laughs> See you guys next month.